Okay, so let's look at shooting an elephant, which is our last essay before we're actually going to get into the narrative assignment. I'll give you your narrative assignment um, at the end of class today. We'll just, we'll just lecture today. I'll give you your narrative assignment at the end of class today, and I'll let you think about uh, which one. You're, you're going to have two options. You really have three options. Uh, one is that you can write a narrative really over whatever you want if you have a story that you would like uh, to tell, like a completely fictional story that you would like to tell, made up character or two in there, that's completely fine. Most students don't want to do that uh, because, in general, most of you guys don't have a lot of uh, practice writing, you know, true short stories, like in a short story fashion. So it's easier for me to provide you a prompt. And I'll provide you a prompt based off of Shooting an Elephant, and I'll provide you a prompt based off of the 4th of July because we've both covered those essays and we've looked at the themes in those essays and the structure of those essays and roundabouts those are pay those are especially like the Fourth of July. It was like three pages long. That's definitely something that you guys can handle. It's a very simple story, um, and uh, even the Fourth of July here is it's a simple story, uh, but it's it's a little longer and it's a little more complex as far as uh, thematically speaking. On the surface, <clears throat> shooting an elephant. Okay, at the very base, you have shooting an elephant here. The actual act of shooting the elephant. This is the conflict, right? Should I shoot? The, the elephant starts to rage. The villagers want him to shoot the elephant. So him shooting or not shooting the, uh, the elephant, that is the initial, that's like the core conflict. On the next level, though, there is the issue of imperialism. And then on the next level, on a much larger level, it's about identity. So the core, you have the, the issue of shooting an elephant. Uh, the next level, it's about um, the imperialism in the world, or the evils of, an imp uh, of imperialism. And imperialism is just the act of, of empires expanding themselves, which one, once you become an empire, you kind of are left with no other choice than to not only expand the empire, but maintain uh, the empire, which in and of itself is a struggle. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then uh, on a very, very much, on a way, way, way much larger level, it's about uh, identity itself, the individual's identity, and how normally you'll see whenever it gets to these like bigger picture ideas, these more heady ideas, they feed off of one another. So students asked me, I had a student ask me yesterday, like what's the difference, um, you know, what's the difference between like entertainment, or how do you know if there is another level, what's the difference between like entertainment literature, or entertainment versus true literature? And all you have to do, or if there's a second, uh, uh, you know, with these la much larger ideas, all you have to do is look beyond the initial conflict. And so that's why I was trying to talk to my, I used the, the Twilight books. They're a perfect example of this. To look at the, you know, the issue of whether or not something is real, is, is true literature that is a layered art or a layered piece of art, which, you know, that goes, that is, that, that works on levels, everything from like pop music. Um, like you can look at pop music that is actual art that has like, that has some deep levels uh, to it. One of the things that we'll, and whenever you get to 1302, we'll probably uh, look at, if you look at like Kendrick, well, Kendrick Lamar's latest release, Damn, and he's got, uh, there's a song on there called DNA, and some of the issues, I mean, that's a, I mean, it's a hip-hop song, but that's, it's, it's like pop hip-hop, like the vast majority of us in this room have heard it, and we come across different racial and cultural and social economic backgrounds, that's pop, because we've all heard it, right? So, uh, if you look at what Kendrick Lamar is trying to examine um, in uh, in a song like uh, like DNA or or in Humble for for that matter, right? Because he like he talks about wanting uh, he wants reality in, in in this existence because we've got a very manufactured fake plastic existence. Like there's like specific. I mean, I can't. I'm not going to go into the grave detail about what he talks about, but he's like he like says that he like misses stretch marks on people, right? Because we're seeing we're so used to seeing like Photoshop. Uh, skin that, that looks rubbery and plastic and fake and is not even representative of all of, 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 uh, of anything that is real, then there's a lot of layers to what he is talking about. In the song DNA, uh, he talks about like, uh, your, your, dad, your father was a snitch, like, uh, what that implies about you, and the issue that we have of, of blood and blood lineage in the United States, which kind of goes against, like we, 
goes against much of what we believe in the United States. The United States is about the individual. Like, whoever your father was has nothing to do with who you are. But, uh, at, but at the same time, there, there is a, uh, the issue of blood lineage or DNA, what is inside of your DNA and what that means. It goes deep. We can talk about it for a very long time. We can't do it now. Uh, we'll do it later on, but not, not now. Uh, versus that, uh, and then like, I don't know, like a Katy Perry song, right? And Katy Perry, like by, by, all, by her own definition, I mean, she, it's not like, it wouldn't be a, an insult to, because to, to, I'm not talking about Katy Perry like as a plast, plastic, like plastic surgery or anything like that, but Katy Perry's image is very plastic. If you look, I, I mean, I'm not really a connoisseur of, of Katy Perry's like music catalog, nor am I a connoisseur of her like music video catalog. But I have seen some Katy Perry like clips of like Katy Perry videos, and it's all pretty make believe. It's all like foamy and plasticky and pink and very, very, very unrealistic, right? And that is like that is like the essence of true pop, like bubblegum pop. Like people are not going to be examining Katy Perry lyrics in thirty years, but they will be examining Kendrick Lamar lyrics in thirty years because there are levels to. The, the game of lyrics in which they're both you know in, in the same in the same arena that they're that they're uh, both kind of competing in. So if you look at stories, short stories, literature in general, um, you ha you're always you're always going to have an initial conflict. And that is that is the number one um, essential characteristic of a of a uh, of a story is that you have a conflict. Now what makes a what propels a story into something possibly greater definitely within. The, uh, and, and into the literary genre is that you have a much deeper conflict that is stemmed on by an external conflict. I think I used the example of John Wick in here with you guys, didn't I? I didn't talk about how okay, raise your hands if you've seen John Wick. Okay, most people have seen John Wick. Okay, so it's like this, like John Wick, um, Keanu Reeves, like this super badass, right? Like his nickname, what's his nickname in the movie? He's a, it's like Bobo Yeshka or something, but it's, I mean, it's the boogeyman, right? He dresses in black, got a badass black car, got black guns. Everything about him is black, right? And black repre is representative of death. And he is the embodiment of death. <coughs> At the beginning of the movie, you see that John Wick is like, um, he is a retired hitman. He's a retired boogeyman that, like, that the, even the toughest Russian mobsters are afraid of him. Uh, and he is what their nightmares are made out of. At the beginning of the movie, though, he has found love. He's no longer this boogeyman and this, like, agent of death or death himself. He's, he finds love in this woman who is soft and is light and sets up the contrast of his darkness versus uh, uh, and, and her light. And then she dies. We don't really know why she dies, like cancer or some kind of sickness she dies. And then she passes on to him. And she buys for him a little bitty cute little puppy. And, I mean, like, of course, like if, like, if you don't like puppies, you're sick. Like, there's something wrong with you, right? Like, you must like puppies. They're so cute and they're fuzzy and they get the big eyes, the big, like, wet eyes and all that stuff. Like, and it's just ingrained in us that we must like puppies. Um, by the way, that is a biological feature like of, uh, of evolution. The reason that babies have those big baby eyes and the reason that like Disney characters and Pixar characters, they over-exaggerate those eyes and you, like, you, uh, that automatically f brings up feelings of affection uh, for those things. It's because that keeps us and that keeps other animals from eating their young. Um, and that's an evolutionary trait, a defense mechanism by like, a, a defenseless uh, a child or a defenseless pup or cub or whatever, those big eyes, they just make you like well up. So, um, so John Wick gets this little puppy and then he encounters someone from his past and they break into his house and then they kill his dog, right? And so this happens like in the first 10 minutes of the movie. His dog dies, right? Or his dog was really actually murdered. And so what happens is that John Wick, then he, um, he literally goes to his basement and he takes a sledgehammer and he digs up his past. And what, it, what his past is, is violence and murder. And then he persists, after literally digging up his past, he puts on the black cloak that he always, or his black suit, puts on his guns, he gets, he takes the gold that he has harvested from like taking the souls of countless other men. And then throughout the movie, he just breaks necks and like pierces throats with his knives and stuff. He just wrecks shop. The reason that the movie was so good and so entertaining, there are a lot of movies that have guys in there that are flipping around in the air and shooting people in the head and all that stuff. You don't really care because, like, like you know, okay, I get it. Like, he's a badass, but I don't really care. There's no motive there because there's no deeper conflict. The real conflict in, in, the in a movie like John Wick that is, like, a good action movie because action movies aren't necessarily associated with, like, good storytelling most of the time. What sets something like John Wick apart is the, other, is the, is the real conflict. 
Part all throughout the movie, they're all the people that John Wick ends up killing, they always kind of allude to like, so you're back in the game, you're back, you're back, you're back. And about three quarters of the way through the movie, there's like this little monologue that he, ha that he has. And John Wick, this was right before he gets really, really mad and just goes, you know, ape on everybody. He says, people keep asking me if I'm back. He's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm back. And then he just murders everyone. And so that's him. Like, that's that's been his whole struggle internally is like the, the, the fact that he has lost his light. Because there was no light inside of him. His wife provided that for him. And then she got a puppy that provided the surrogate of light for him and then his old life the people from his old life they they removed the light from him and whenever they removed the light from him they removed his chance of hope his chance of salvation his chance for peace so he fully embraces his shadow self and his darkness and then just goes ham on everybody right but the the real conflict is the light versus the dark that lies within him and him realizing that there is no light within me without my wife that there is no light within me without my dog and i'm going to bring my darkness on those that have taken the light from me Right, and that's a real conflict. I mean, that's a that's a real conflict that we all have: is the light versus the darkness inside all of us, right? And the what makes us a, what makes you a good person, what makes you a moral person, is acknowledging the shadows inside of you, acknowledging the darkness inside of you, and then choosing to do good, despite of that, right? If you're just like if you're just all light, people like that are just all light, and they don't really like, you know, like a dog has the morality of someone that's just all good. That doesn't make you a good person. You're like, you must choose to do good because you recognize the fact that you have darkness within you. All that to say is that there are much, much, much deeper levels to something so simple as like a, a kicky, you know, kick em, punch em kind of shooty, shoot em up movie like John Wick. Um, this story, talking about imperialism and identity, just start to peel back the layers and see if there's anything there that makes sense. That's how you'll know. If you get used to doing that, you'll be able to recognize those things Pretty, pretty immediately, and then be able to enjoy them on a much, much, much deeper level. And, and that is something that is always like, you know when people talk about like acquired tastes? Like sushi is something that is an acquired taste, but like true sushi, not like a roll that's got a ton of mayonnaise and like fried breadcrumbs and God knows what else on top of it, but like true sushi is an acquired taste. I didn't like it itself whenever I first started eating it, uh, like like. Sashimi and unagi, like I didn't really like it, but I, I love it now. It's like one of my favorite foods to eat. But it took me a while to really, and I had to like, you know, you kind of gradually get your way into enjoying something like that. Like beer. Beer is like, Benjamin Franklin said that beer is proof that God loves us and makes and wants us to be happy. And I truly believe that. I love beer so incredibly much. But I don't like, like natural light or like keystone light. I don't like that stuff. It tastes horrible. But, like, you know, whenever you first start drinking, what's the kind of junk that you're going to drink? Really, guys? Nobody in here? You're going to hammer through as many beers as you can to get the maximum, like, enjoyment in the short period because you're afraid that you're going to get caught. And you're like, why do people like this in the first place? Because you're drinking it for the wrong reason. But you, you, you end up drinking beer, and then you acquire a taste for beer. And then something that, you know, many people, like, they drink once, like, oh, my God, why would you ever drink that? Well, you're not supposed to drink that beer. You're supposed to drink the really nice beer that actually tastes good. But the beer that actually really tastes good, if you give it to someone the first time, they're going to like the Keystone Light stuff, even though it's, like, kind of like water. It's just, it's so watery, but it's a, a, a taste that is acquired. So many acquired tastes, right? Like you don't like at first, but then once you learn, you have to like educate yourself in, in greater pleasures of this world, right? Because if you don't do that, that's the equivalent of you like staying and eating Twinkies, like Twinkies being like the high mark for good food for you, right? Like you're supposed to evolve beyond like Twinkies being the end all be all than a, a dessert, right? If you're a 40 year old man and you still think a Twinkie is a good dessert, you're a man child, and there's something wrong with you. Like you, I, and look, I like Twinkies, but like I'm not going to go out to a nice dinner with my wife and be like, you know, it'd be really great after this nice steak and potatoes, Twinkie. All right? It's like, what is wrong with you? So it's the same thing. Whenever you look at stories, you, the more that you start to look at them in this manner, one, the more that you will be able to be engaged with them, and then will at, you can inform your opinions about the world around you, make you question the world around you, and make you enjoy stories, make you enjoy movies. Uh, and it don't, it won't take you long to figure out if there's another level. Well, I, I, also, I went on this tangent about uh, because of uh, the Twilight books, right? Like, I'm not a big, I, I don't get the Twilight books because they're not, they weren't written for. A, a man like myself, or really for like most men, right? They're written for they're written for prepubescent teenage girls and 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 older women that have not developed uh, that have not truly developed emotionally because 
that and that have not, and I don't mean that as like a I don't mean that as a as a as a slant. When I mean they haven't developed emotionally, I, mean, I, I talk about that as in reference to like their understanding of story and literature. Because if you look on the surface, right? If you look at the surface, it's about this teenage girl that falls in love uh, with this um, with this like god like creature, right? Because the vampires in the Twilight books they have. They're, they're hard as statues, right? They have their skin is made up of diamonds. They're these glittering, beautiful creatures. And, um, and they've been around for a long time, so they're super wealthy. They're super smart. Like, it's the perfect man, but it's not a man. And it can't be a man because no man is that perfect, so it must be another creature. Well, and then that's, okay, yeah. And then they fall in love, and he can't get enough of her. He follows her around wherever he goes. There's something about her, which is like her scent, her blood, whatever it is. Like, that he just he is just inherently... Uh, drawn to and can't get enough of her, and she's like, oh, you know, like, why does this perfect person love me? I'm so... Uh. But if you look at it like on, a, on, a, on a deeper level, just the story itself, just the romance itself, you look at it on a... On a just peel back the first, like, superficial layer. How old is this girl? Like 18. 15, 16, maybe 17. How old is the main vampire that she falls in love with? Yeah, like, he's 100-something years old, right? Right there, that is an inherent conflict of true storytelling and true romance, right? Because, like, look, I love you guys. I really do. I enjoy teaching you. And I enjoy talking to you guys. But, like, that whole, you know, the whole, like, cliche thing of, like, the college professor and, like, the young, you know, freshman student romance, all that stuff. Like, that is, so, I cannot imagine what I would talk to an 18-year-old girl about for, like, an hour over dinner, let alone an actual romance. There's nothing to say. We are on two different levels right now. I'm 35 years old, and I've got a lot in my life that you are not even going to be able to close to compare yourself to or relate to. And you shouldn't because you're an 18-year-old young lady, and you've got a lot of living to do, and you should live that and not be stifled by some creepy 35-year-old guy. Now take my age and multiply it by three. And then take your age and an 18-year-old young lady and minus it by three. And that's messed up, right? That is super gross. And um, we suspend our imagination and belief with that, with the, within the world of the Twilight stories because that show was, I mean, that movie was so popular. Those books were so popular. Uh, and that's fine for, like, surface-level entertainment. But if you look at what it is, that is a, that is a childlike fantasy by a, but created by a woman that, it, that appeals to the uttermost childlike fantasies of young women and, uh, and adult women as well. Because the neither of the characters have any real flaws. The uh, the girl, uh, the Kristen Stewart plays, you know, the, she has no real flaws except for the fact that she's clumsy. That is her one flaw. And if you are a clumsy girl, what does that allow a man to do? Pick you up, catch you whenever you fall, put his head behind you before he lays you down. That is that. So that that one flaw is not really a flaw whatsoever. This is an endearing quality to have your the. The, uh, the counterpoint to your flaw, be able to make up for that. And if you look at the flaw of the, of the vampire, who has really none, to my estimation, the only thing that he is is that he is, he's, so, oh, he's so caring for her and follows her around and has this undeniable attraction to her and this need to be around her scent and her blood, and that is what nourishes him. And then if you look at what happens throughout the story, I don't know how exactly how old she is. I know that they get married, and I know that they have kids, and the baby grows like a mutant for some reason. Um, but if you, oh, and also if you have, you also have the incest thing as well, because you have the werewolf, right? The werewolf dude, he falls in love with the, the high school girl's daughter whenever she's like six months old. But it's not like really love. It's like it's like imprinting. So he'll love her until she becomes like legally right to love. And then that's when they'll consummate their love together. Still weird. Um, this is justification. There's a justification of pedophilia that goes on. Because even the, the author that, that themselves are like, this is not, there's something right. So I've got to come up with like this little justification. I've got to invent this tool called imprinting to, to make sure that all, all the pieces uh, you know, fit together. But it's manufactured. It's not, a natural, it's not a natural story that comes full circle. But again, you have this 150-year-old like, diamond-skinned god that then marries a girl when she's like, I don't know how old she is in the books or in the movies when they get married, but she's not over 20 years old. A 150-year-old man marrying a 20-year-old girl, not only does he marry her, but what else does he do to her? Well, they make a baby. Sure, he knocks her off with a little monster. What else? <laughs> he turns her into a vampire, right? She becomes a vampire. He becomes a vampire, and by becoming a vampire, he is robbing her 
of her mortality, right? And then and, and the, the, the whole thing is like, well, you don't really know, you know, you don't really know what you're doing. You don't really know what you're doing. Why don't you really think about it, uh, whatever her name is. Why don't you really think about it, really think about it. Like, okay, I really thought about it. I'm 20 years, I'm tw now that I'm 20, I thought about it and I'm 20 years old now, I'm going to make a decision to forfeit my mortality to become a blood-sucking vampire. You don't know anything when you're 20 years old. You don't know anything when you're 25, newsflash. You don't know anything when you're 26. Get to 27 and you might start learning a few things about the world. Because I promise you, when you're 25, 26, you're going to look back when you're 17, 18. It's like now when you look back when you're 13, 14 years old, like, oh my God. I was an idiot. I was so dramatic. I was so da, 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 da. You know, anything when you're 20 years old, let alone whether or not you're going to forfeit your soul to, like, drink human blood for the rest of your life. So he robs her of that mortality, and he, um, and robs her from her, her, her familial relationships. She can never see her father again. She can never see her mother again. It's messed up. But that's because, like, it's not, like, literature. It's just an entertainment story. It's like, it's like a movie, or it's like a book with Fabio on the cover. Of it. Like, you're not supposed to go any deeper than that. Like, that's, that's all that there is to it. If you look at, uh, like, like, for example, uh, shooting an elephant, there is the, there are these other levels. What is imperialism? Imperialism kind of coexists with empires. Before, um, well, right, well, before World War II, because of World War II, many would well, um, many would describe uh, Britain or England had the was the empire of the world. There was a, undoubtedly, uh, you know, and uh, up and through the early 1900s, for several hundred years, the British Empire, there was a saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. So somewhere in the world, if the sun was shining, there was a part of the British Empire that was under that sun. It was huge. The, the Brits dominated uh, the world. Uh, and which is a pretty amazing fact for a country, for a nation that's just a small little island off the coast of, of Europe. Um, because of that, they were, they had to be very good uh, seafarers and be able to sail and uh, if history has shown us really anything that if you that the people that, that boat people or water people are very very apt and adept at conquering other lands uh, because of their ability to, to traverse the ocean and um, and, uh, and adapt many things attack settle and then leave and then set up establishments and stuff people that rule the seas oftentimes rule the world or well, a vast majority of the world um, and so uh, it was after World War II that uh, their infrastructure suffered a, a uh, took a huge hit, obviously. Uh, and around uh, around that time, America's rise in prominence that uh, America has ha began to rise. And obviously, today America is like the, a modern empire of the world. You can't really dispute that. Um, just if you look at the size of America and America's presence, uh, and at, like in, in the vast majority of like every the vast majority of the countries that exist, America is a modern. Uh, is the world's uh, new empire. And so the act of imperialism is just simply spreading your empire or maintaining your empire in other regions or other areas where it is not necessarily native or local. So um, you're set up with that problem of imperialism, and then the overarching theme is the, the, the problem with identity uh, and, how the, uh, and how a person's identity uh, it kind of relates to or interacts with uh, imperialism. So George Orwell uh, is a he's a very, he's a famous British author. He's famous more famous for 1984 and the Animal Farm than he is for this short story. He is most famous for his novels. 1984. If you haven't read it, you should. Uh, he wrote it back in the 50s, and he was kind of he was he was predicting what would happen in the year 1984 and the in the age of disinformation, uh, uh, lack of privacy, spying. And uh, stuff on fellow citizens and, uh, and uh, his faceless, nameless, faceless enemy that we fight overseas that just kind of changes from, like, from year to year or month to month. Um, and you don't really know who the, you're fighting. You just know you're at war with this, again, like a nameless, faceless entity. If you read it then, and then if you read it, look at what he predicted like you know, 40 years before he wrote it. And then you look at the world that we live in now. The parallels are very, very, very startling. So uh, George Orwell knew his stuff. He worked with the British government, worked for the British government, uh, and this is part of an, an earlier period of his life whenever he is in Burma. Uh, where's Burma? Also known as Myanmar. Anybody know? Burma's in Southeast Asia. Uh, there's Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. So um, that's going to set up something that is kind of a quandary as to why 
Why is a British subdivisional police officer, and why is Britain in Burma? In, huh? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously they're expanding their influence and stuff, but what, what purpose is there to be in Burma? Uh, Southeast Asia in general, like India is right here, Southeast Asia is kind of right here, and then China and Europe, all this, uh, China and uh, Russia, all that stuff is kind of over here. Yeah, what resources though? Well, there's a couple different things. In Southeast Asia, on the west side of Southeast Asia, you have, uh, like, Thailand has always been allegiant to the British. Um, and the British are obviously here in Burma, which is above Thailand. And then uh, Laos kind of come kind of lost in the trade. But uh, to the east, you have uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. And Cambodia and Vietnam have a heavy, heavy, well, actually settled uh, or, or colonized in many respects by the French. So I don't know like, if you guys, like, eat Vietnamese food, but, like, on me sandwiches and stuff yeah. like, yeah, like Vietnamese didn't invent a French baguette. The French did, and they brought it over there, and they started mixing it with their pickled vegetables and awesome meats, and that's how you got a bon me. Same thing with the, with uh, Vietnamese coffee. So you have on the west the British and the, and the east the French, and like newsflash, but the Brits and the French they don't really like each other. So there's kind of bad battling for some type of control between trade from India and um, and, and China. But also, you have a very, very important resource in, in Burma, um, which is jewels, or which are jewels. Do you guys know what blood diamonds are? What are blood diamonds? Red diamonds. No, close. That's rubies. <laughs> now, blood diamonds are, they're not really red. Rubies are different, but that's a joke. Anyway, blood diamonds are, are, are diamonds that are, are mined or farmed in, in Africa. And they basically use, not basically, they use slave labor to, uh, to mine diamonds out of these huge, just like pits to hell, basically. Now, there are, more slaves, there are more slaves alive right now than there ever have been in the history of the world. Most people don't really know that. I didn't know that until a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, well, there's a movement with Leonardo DiCaprio about, uh, about blood diamonds. So they basically, they take Africans, they chain them up, and they make them mine their own wealth out of their own ground. And then these European, European companies will take them and uh, bring them back to Europe. Uh, with diamonds, you have this thing called manufactured um, uh, supply. I'm sorry, manufactured scarcity. So manufactured scarcity with diamonds, like, you know, we, believe, we, we ascribe such value to diamonds because we don't think that there are that many of them. Right? Just by definition, if something is scarce, it will be valuable. But the thing is, is that diamonds really aren't. It was all manufactured. So there are these companies, like the De Beers family is uh, famous because of the De Beers diamonds, and they like have this basically close to a monopoly. Uh, and they're a European family over the diamond trade and the diamond industry. And they've got billions of diamonds in their, lo in their uh, vaults. But if, let's, say I've got, let's say that I've got a million diamonds in my vault. And I only release 50 of them. You don't know that I've got a million diamonds. You only know that I've released 50 of them and put them in my store. Are they going to be very valuable? Yes. Yes. Now, let's say I release a half a million of them. Are they going to be as valuable? No. No. So, the diamond industry is something that was manufactured as far as its scarcity by, di by buying up all of these diamonds that, that, ha that possess some rarity but not as much as we believe that they do. Uh, then once somebody is able to do that and it becomes kind of ingrained in culture and society that it is, it is rare, then it just stays rare. It's an interesting thing. Because now they have diamonds that like, they have man-made diamonds that are the exact same thing, like down to the atom. They're the exact same thing as an actual natural diamond. But they cost like a fraction of the, uh, a fraction of the cost. So, ladies, let me ask you this. So, if, or guys too, whatever. Um, if you had a diamond that was a real diamond that was worth $100,000, and then on the other hand, you had a diamond that was the exact same, it was just man-made, but down to the atom, you could not tell the difference. Atomically, it is the same, but it costs $10,000. Which one do you want to get? Oh. Liar. You was gonna give it, it was going to be given to you. You're not going to have to buy it. It was going to be given to you. Which one do you want? Right, but they're both real. They're both real. But of course, like in your mind, like, well, yeah, they're hundred thousand dollars. So what? It's the same as the ten thousand. Take the other ninety thousand dollars, put a big old down payment on a house. I don't care. That's a hundred thousand dollar diamond, right? It's like it's like the it's like Valentine's Day. Like we know who created Valentine's Day. 
Man, well, yeah, man, obviously. I mean, Hallmark specifically. Hallmark specifically created Valentine's Day several decades ago to, like, to boost their sales and, uh, you know, to work in with chocolate and wine and all that stuff. So now, like, my wife and I both know, we're fairly educated people, we both know that, that Valentine's Day was manufactured by Hallmark in order to boost their sales and to secure their place uh, at a off-season, post-Thanksgiving uh, post, uh, and, and Christmas season, to boost their sales in a, in a slow quarter. My wife and I both know that, but I also know, I also know very well that if Valentine's Day comes and I don't get my wife a card or some chocolate or something, like, I'm going to be in trouble because, like, that's just what you do. Even though we both know it's like a lie, it's not a real thing, it's not a real holiday that really means anything that has any real religious affiliation or anything. It's just a man, like a brand new holiday, it might as well be like Star, Star Trek Reunion Day or something like that. Like, we know it has that little weight, really, but it doesn't emotionally. It just matters. Well, in Burma... They have rubies and they have jade, and jade is one of is actually the most valuable jewel on the planet because you can't make jade, you can't manufacture jade. Uh, each piece of jade is unique in and of itself in the way that the, the 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 dark and the and the light greens are swirled and the depth that they have, and more importantly, is that it has it is one of the it is probably the most valuable thing in Chinese culture. It's jade. They have not only is there like a cultural status ascribed to it, but there's like mythical and mystical status uh, ascribed to many things about or surrounding jade. Oh, you agree with me? Yeah. Very, 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 very valuable, and they do very, very bad things to do it. And in Burma, to this day, they still have issues with uh, with blood jewels, not blood diamonds like they do in Africa, but blood jewels. A lot of bad stuff going on to this day. There's like a massive genocide going on um, uh, in Burma. I actually know a guy that was... I worked with a guy when I lived in Thailand that was an ex-military, ex-special forces guy, and he was like smuggling people from northern, uh, out of Burma into northern Thailand. We had this refuge and stuff. A lot of bad stuff that goes on there. Can you imagine? Well, look at the crown jewels of England. The crown jewels of England and all throughout Buckingham Palace and all that. You don't go to England to mine jewels. So where do they get them? Yeah, they, I mean, they jacked them from other countries, right? That's what they're doing here. Can you imagine if you if somebody came to your door and they had a gun and like, all right, take hey, go to the shed and get a shovel. Like, okay. So they go, they're holding the gun to you, you go to the backyard, and then they tell you to start digging. You start digging in your backyard, and then oh my god, here are these diamonds and rubies and jade and jewels, all this stuff. And like, all right, go put them in that bag over there. Okay, you put them, and then they take the bag from them, like with the, while they're holding the gun, like, thanks, peace out, and then they leave. Right? Now it would be like it's gonna suck either way, but I would rather at least like tie me up and sit me down in a chair, and then let me watch you as you at least dig for yourself. But to make someone, to not only steal their wealth out of their backyard, but to make them dig it themselves is even like, that's just adding insult to injury. And that's what the British did or do. Is they would like, not only would they enslave a native, or steal from a native population in a country that wasn't their own, but they would enslave the native population, make them do all the work, not give them any rewards for stealing or for taking their own wealth out of the ground, and then just kind of leave them um, abused and desolated and just impoverished. Which is part of the reason that you have here. These they're not treating they don't treat the Burmese well enough. So the Burmese they want uh, they want this elephant that has kind of gone crazy. This is a, like an elephant's like a sacred symbol to them. They want it to be shot so that they can finally have enough meat to feed themselves. So, here he was a subdivisional police officer. Um, he talks about this anti-European, a European feeling here uh, that was just, you could just feel. He said, uh, here he talks about the sneering yellow faces of yellow men uh, that met me everywhere. And he later he talks about wanting to uh, drive a bayonet into a, Brutus, a Buddhist priest's guts. And um, but there's a couple things that are interesting too, because do, do Buddhists have like priests? Well, the common word for it, like here is from England, right? So a priest is something you would have like the Catholic Church or an Evangelical Church. A monk is something that you would call a, like a Buddhist monk is probably what he's talking about. But he just refers to him as a priest. And also you have here. Uh, the sneering yellow faces, again, which is an interesting term as well, because that is, well, one, that's a derogatory and, and, and racist term, but that is mainly a term, I'm not going to go like in deep on like Asian racist terms uh, or anything, but this is something that is, that, is, that is ascribed more to Chinese. 
Chinese people. Because I don't know if any of you know what someone from Burma looks like, but they don't look Chinese. They're much more dark skinned uh, because they're they're situated much more closer, much more close to uh, uh, really to, to India. Bur Burmese don't look anything at all like Chinese, nor do they look like anything like Thais or, or whatever. Uh, now there's like a, there's like cultural mixing because of Chinese influence in South Southeast Asia, so you have more of, more of that uh, more mixing of like, the skin color stuff. But what he's doing here, what he's doing here is, is showing you basically even his own ignorance, right? So he's like just those yellow faces, like well that's one. That you're like you're you're not, you're not even you're not even being racist towards the right race, really. Um, and also here, like the Buddhist priest, well, it's not really priest, probably like a monk is probably what you're talking about. And what you see like here, when, and, and this, is what, this is like a byproduct of, of imperialism as well, is that an empire, a stronger, larger empire, generally, no, actually not generally, never does its homework on a society or on a culture. So if you're going to rule a group of people, if you're going to lord over a group of people, you need to understand who they are, what they are. They're not just all these like sweeping, just like natives, basically, right? Where they all just look the same, so they all must be the same. Because one, they don't look the same. Uh, and two, they don't all believe the same things, right? America, that's like a, a thing that America has had to learn the past 100 years. I mean, we for the past 100 years, in general, America is kind of like, you know what, we're going to, this, we're going to give them the, the, the gift of democracy. We're going to give them the gift of freedom. We're, democracy, you know. Does everybody want a democracy? No, no. Not at all. No, not at all. Some people want a monarchy. Some people want a king. Some people want to be ruled in that way. And that's not an uncommon thing because the vast majority of civilization has been under the rule of a king in some form or another. So, I mean, America's democracy is a relatively new invention in the history of civilization. And just because we live this way does not mean that the rest of the people on this planet want to live that way. Um, the idea of a king, like, the idea of a king, like, offends many uh, Americans, like, just to our core. Because that's how, like, that's not the world that we grew up in. Uh, but if you go, like, to Southeast Asia, Cambodia has a king, Thailand has a king, everybody in, in Thailand has... Every house in Thailand, every picture, every business, I mean, every business tablet, every building has a picture of their king in Thailand. And you better not talk <coughs> bad about him or bad things can and will happen to you. Like on a regular basis, they love their king and they couldn't dream of not having one. Um, many of them, uh, the king in, in, in Thailand at least is like a, he's just like a symbolic figure. He doesn't really help hold a lot of power as far as politics and government regulations go. But a lot of people in Thailand, if they like, if they had the choice, they'd go back to living under that rule of the king of Thailand for the pride that they have of their country and the pride that they have of their king, and that's the way that their kingdom has been set up for a thousand years and on and on and on. Well, I think to convince them that, that, that a democracy and uh, electing a president like we've got is the right way to go. So you know, we uh, it, like empires don't they don't ever like really consider that though. They just like come in with like this black and white rule, and that never really goes well because people don't respond to that at all. Okay, so page 168. Um, so, like I said, I had already made up my mind that imperialism was an evil thing, and the sooner I chucked up my job and got out of it, the better, theoretically and secretly, of course, I was off the Burmese and all against their oppressors, the British. Here again, those, and he talks about wanting to drive a bayonet into the young uh, priest's guts. And what you've got, you got is an interesting thing. And that's what he says. Uh, these are normal byproducts of imperialism. Ask any Anglo-Indian official if you can catch him off duty. So what's going on here is this, this byproduct of imperialism, and this is how it, we begin to examine how it works with identity. So, um, you have no idea how much of your identity is shaped on your, by your nation or by your national identity? Let me reword that. You have no idea how much your national identity is tied into your own personal identity. Very few of you do. And the reason that you don't know that is because very few have, of you have been removed from your nation. So, um, I, um, I was able to experience this on a couple different levels. Myself, I, I grew up. I grew up in Bridge City. I grew up in Southeast Texas. I graduated high school when I was seventeen years old, and uh, and I went to school at Texas A and M. I graduated A and M, and then I moved to Seattle. And I lived in Seattle for uh, several months. 
uh, before I ended up moving to, uh, to, to Europe. And then when I, I lived in Europe for months, I just, I hitchhiked and I hitchhiked around uh, Europe for a long time uh, until um, Hurricane Rita hit and I came, up, came back here to help my family out. Um, and in Seattle, you know, I'd like, I'd gone to, I'd taken road trips throughout the United States. I'd gone to different states and I went to like, you know, like we don't, in America, like you don't, you're not really challenged much with your national identity by other nations, really. Because like to the north of us, you have Canada and they're just like more polite Americans. And to the south, you have Mexico. But when most people go to Mexico, they don't go to Mexico. They're like Cancun or Cozumel or something like that. And to where they're in a safe little guarded space where they can go and they can do tequila shots off people's belly buttons and, I don't know, have as much guacamole and chips as you can possibly get. But they're not going outside like the compound. They're not going to the real Mexico. They're not going to be confronted because they're like obviously they're, I mean, you're, you're told not to go out there because of the boogeyman that exists outside of these gates or outside of this gated community for you. So you're not going to be confronted by another real culture either. So the Mexico that you get in, 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 in Mexico is like is an American Mexico, which is not at all like Mexico. So you can live your whole life and then think that you've gone to like, you know, I've been to the, I've been to the Bahamas. Like, no, you haven't. You haven't been to the Bahamas. You've been to like the, like the American resort of the Bahamas, right? The Caribbean, same thing, right? I love, I love it when people come back there and like they have little braids in their hair, like come back from the Caribbean, like, oh, yeah, culture was so amazing. Like, where'd you go? The resort. You didn't go to the Caribbean. Like, get out of here, right? Like, you went to an America, like, that was sectioned off on this island. So, because you want to feel comfortable there. They want you to feel comfortable so that you come back. So, they're not going to confront you with a different way of life or a different way of thinking because that's a jolt to your system, which makes you uncomfortable. So, all these resort places and stuff, like, if you go there, you don't, don't, stop. You didn't, you didn't really go anywhere else. You went to America, just a different place. So, what you have is you can live your whole life without being confronted with, with, you know, other things about your nation that you don't, that doesn't exa- cause you to examine yourself. So I remember when I went to Seattle, um, I never in my life, never in my life did I ever talk about Texas or being from Texas when I lived here. But when I moved, and I didn't really know what to talk to people about because I didn't have anything in common with them. We didn't have, we didn't have shared, like, clothes or culture or just much of anything. And this is like, this is just within America, Right. I would talk about like being from Texas, like I almost I like I leaned real heavy into being a dude from Texas, which is embarrassing to say. But like I was like, you know, twenty years old, so it really wasn't that big of a deal because you're stupid when you're twenty. Um, and so I, I leaned real hard in being this Texas dude, not to where I was like wearing a big belt buckle and like a head, ten gallon hat or anything like that. But I would bring it up when I could, especially like to fill gaps in conversation, because I just I didn't and I and I was like, whoa, whoa, okay, like so that's. I didn't really know how much of like being in being around people or being in Texas informed my behavior, informed my thought process, informed my conversational skills. And then you take that; it was another shock for me because I lived there for a while, and then I went to I went to Europe. And when I went to Europe, um, there was this was not too long after September 11th, and the United States was in the Middle East, and like we had this big thing with the Europeans, especially like the French and stuff. You remember whenever we stopped having French fries? We didn't have French fries in the United States for like two years. What did we have? Freedom fries. Because screw the French. Because they didn't agree with our policy overseas. And the French said that, that they didn't agree with us. So we're like, well, screw you, France. We're taking your name off of our fries. And now we got freedom fries, which were the exact same thing. Same shape, same fry method, everything. They were just freedom fries, not French fries. So, I know, very mature response from the number one country in the world, I know. Um, so when I went overseas and I would like go to bars, talk to people, have coffee, whatever. Um, I was so stupid too. I had like super long hair and I had like curl snap shirts and like boots. So like you knew, like I wasn't European. Um, and, uh, and so everywhere I go, like, I talk to people and stuff and, and, and everybody always want to talk to me about like our foreign policy and like what, what, what are, because we had George Bush at the time and George Bush like le- Talk about leaning into roles. George Bush leaned hardcore into being this cowboy Texan. Uh, and, and was he? Or is he? Right? No, because that might be a little too young for you. No, George Bush was like a cheerleader at Yale. No kidding. Like he has a little get up with a cute little, little hat with a little Y on it. And he do his cheers and stuff on the sideline. Not a Texan dude whatsoever. It wasn't until he decided that he wanted to come back to Texas to run for governor and then run for the United States that he started wearing the cowboy boots 
cowboy hat, throwing a chainsaw over his shoulder and like cutting down limbs and stuff at his ranch. Never, he did not grow up here. He didn't grow up doing any of that stuff. He was like a little preppy boy, Yankee. Uh, and he finally, he beat a guy out that grew up on a ranch. Whenever he became a governor, the, the, original, the, the, the original race that he ran to become a governor, he beat out, he out Texan the most Texas dude that ever ran for governor in the first place. He grew up like as a ranch hand working on a ranch. George Bush like just leaned into this like fictional character. So we had that kind of in the, we had that very much in the, in the White House because like people were calling the president a, a cowboy and the moves uh, that the president was making or that America was making is these independent cowboy like moves. So everybody was fascinated and, and like one, not only am I American, but also I'm from Texas. And so anytime I would talk to people, I was like, I wasn't ashamed or I wasn't afraid of talking to anybody by any stretch of the imagination. So I get in conversations with people, and that's all they want to talk about. Like, why are we in the Middle East? Why is your president doing that? Dude, I don't care. I don't know. You know about as much as I do. Like, I don't care. But what I found in interesting and what kind of disturbed me is that if, my, if it was like my dad and I, and we were on the back porch at my dad's house, and we were like barbecuing and drinking a beer, like doing Texas men stuff, right? But if, he, if we were doing that, and my dad said to me, he's like, you know what? Like, I think that the president is doing A, B, and C. I think he's doing these things incorrectly and i think that we should probably we should probably be focusing our policy on doing dc that whatever i would probably like yeah you know what you're probably right or whatever i wouldn't get defensive at all i wouldn't really care but there's a difference between my dad saying that when i'm on the back porch in texas with my family in america and then this just like little wispy french dude with a mustache and the way that he's sitting there like holding his beer talking to me about America and what America should do. Like, there's a diff like I want to do different things to him yeah. than I do to my dad because, like, he's not American, so shut up, you little French dude, because I'll put you through the wall. Like, but th because there's a difference. Why? What's the difference? Because he's not, he is the other. He's not like me. He's not us, right? So he doesn't know. So what happens whenever you're confronted, especially whenever you're removed from all of your support that tells you who you are, how you are, you feel that, uh, you feel, you, it is a scary thing to, re, to be removed from a country, from a city, from a family, whatever, and then to be taken out of there. And then someone starts to talk about them, and then you get so defensive. As, but, and that's fine if they're wrong. But what if they're right and you get defensive anyway? That's not okay, right? That's like the people like, when, like you know, people that pride themselves for having the friend that's got their back no matter what. That's not a good friend to you. Because they're reinforcing your worst behavior. If they've got your back, no matter what you do, like if they'll help you hide the bodies, you might be a body too to them. Because that's not a good person to have in your life. You think it is because you want that, un, that, you know, that unwavering support and that unwavering loyalty. But if you do things that cause you to not have loyalty, that is your own problem. You need someone that will call out your BS. But we don't want that, right? So, so much of our identity is, is formed by our... Uh, by, like, by, by our nation, by our country, and by our culture, that you never, I mean, you know that on one level, but you never feel that unless you're really removed from it. And you'd be like, oh, man, okay. Like, I feel this way irrationally so. And that, that, that can be an issue. Uh, and then you, look, you can go back and you can look at your childhood. How many of you guys, I, I grew up doing this, how many of you guys pledged allegiance to the flag every morning? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's an interesting thing, right? Because... Um, do you know what it means to pledge allegiance when you're five years old? No. Do you even know what that implies? No. No. That's the exact same thing. A lot of that, I mean, a lot of learned behavior is important, right? Like, you love your brother or your sister or you love your cousin, right? But whenever you're like five years old and they're three years old, do you really love them? Because no. they're like stealing your toys and all that? No, but your parents tell you. Like, you ha you're forced to love them, right? You have to love them. The true love develops later on, obviously. But you have to love, then that's taught to you, right? So that we do the same thing with the flag. Like you pledge allegiance to the flag. When you're five, six, seven years old, what does that even mean? One, are you even doing that because you choose to? No, you're, no, you're doing that because you're forced to. But what that does is that starts the cycle of having a national identity. And I'm not saying that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. But what there is, what is undebatable is that does have an end result. And that does, that does result in a national identity. And as Americans, oftentimes we don't really think that we have a national identity. I didn't think that I had one. I didn't think that I, I could give two dams about a lot of stuff that uh, that I was confronted with when I went overseas, and people started asking me. It was like, you know, 
I was like, I don't really care. I don't really care. And then they'd start like dogging the United States, like dogging the things that we did. And I'm like, shut up. Like, we're right, you know, <laughs> like we're number one. And you just revert back to that because you have no idea how important that is to you until you're removed. And that's what he's going through right here. Like he knows what his country is doing is wrong. He knows it. But whenever someone calls him out on it, what does he want to do? He wants to gut them, right? Gut them like a fish. Which is not uncommon. That's what he talks about. He goes, this is, this is a completely normal byproduct of imperialism. That's one of the most normal things you do because you're set up. It sets up this internal conflict that you have. Okay. So, he begins talking about this. He goes on about his day. And then we get to the conflict of the elephant. And he knows that he shouldn't shoot the elephant. He doesn't want to. Um, here, he talks about this image of him, the magical rifle. Um, he's worth watching. They expected him uh, to do it. He's this, here he talks about a, a white man with a gun standing in front of the unarmed native crowd, right, which is a very powerful image, right, like a white dude, gun, and a bunch of natives in front of him. Like, what are they going to do? If I, got, if I got the gun and you're all a bunch of natives and I tell you to, like, get up and dance around, what are you going to do? Get up and dance around because I'll shoot you, right? So um, the thing is, is that, what, what's interesting about this is that it has always been like, like you can just imagine like any, <laughs> any country that, that like white people with guns have gone into where they didn't have guns. Like a white dude gets off the boat, gets on his horse, and he's got a gun, and he goes and tells a bunch of people that you know, aren't white without guns to go do whatever. And they pretty much do whatever, they get shot. And so that's, like a, that's kind of like a classic image or symbol of, of power and rule. But what's interesting about this, though, is that it's is that it allows you to look at the flip side of that. Because once you put yourself, and that's what, he, that's what he talks about here, he becomes a sort of hollow, posing dummy, the conventionalized speaker of Asahib, for it is the condition of his rule that he shall spend his life trying to impress the natives. And so in every crisis, he has got to do what the natives expect of him. He wears a mask, and his face grows to fit it. You need to know the line. He wears a mask, and his face grows to fit it. I had got to shoot the elephant. I had committed myself to doing it when I was sent for the rifle. A sahib has got to act like a sahib. He has got to appear resolute to know his own mind and do definite things. He said, now to, to have come all this way and not shoot the elephant was impossible. So what he discovers is that the moment that you put yourself as the authority figure, the moment that I stand in front of you with a gun and I tell you, do what I say or I'll shoot you, what must I be able to do? Shoot you. Because if I don't, I might as not, you know, I might as well not be holding that gun in the first place. So it's not really I that have the power. Who does who has the power? You have the power, right? The, the name of the unarmed crowd has the power. Because all they have to do is test your will. And if you don't respond in kind with what you promise you will, then it's over for you. You've lost that authority. And you know, and you look at how normally that works out. It is human nature to test authority, right? I mean, I, I have a, my, my two-year-old daughter. If I tell her, don't cross that line, she's going to get as close to her as she possibly can, and then she's going to start inching her little toes onto the line to see what it'll take me to get up out of my recliner and like, swat her with a newspaper or something like a dog. I don't, really, I don't do that to my daughter, but... I'm just saying it for effect. Um, and like, no, stop. Don't you have to cross the line. Now she knows how close she can get without getting popped or without getting, you know, reprimanded by her father. Right? Whenever you have, whenever you have, you know, relationship, people talk about the, one of the most important things to do in a relationship is establish boundaries. <laughs> Once you establish boundaries with your girlfriend or boyfriend, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to test those boundaries. And if you don't let them know, this is what I will accept and this is what I will not accept, they'll push them every single time or they'll step over those boundaries every time single time. People do that. That is human nature. When you put somebody in a cage, you put somebody in a fence, the first thing they do is they go to that cage, they go to that fence and see, and they start crushing it. They start testing it. I work in a prison. I work at, uh, at the, in the prison at night, so I've been teaching there for ten year, uh, seven, year, eight, seven or eight years. Love it. Walk in a prison, every single prisoner is up against the bars with their hands out, kind of like kind of testing those bars. It's just a natural thing. We all test our boundaries. And so, if you do not respond in kind as the authority figure, then you've lost that position of authority. But people in general will never stop testing those boundaries. Right? They're always, they'll always push, always push. And what, what happens, uh, many of this is necessary. right? Like my, my role 
as a father, right? It is a tireless role to reinforce morality to my daughter, to reinforce boundaries to my daughter, and to reinforce societal rules and familial rules that I have established as the head of the household that will be followed, no questions asked. And that is a role that I willingly take on, and that is for the betterment of my daughter. I'm not going to take on that role for my neighbor's kid, though. Right? I'm not going to take that role on for the kid that lives halfway across the town either. Because it's not my kid, and I can't do that because I'm not in their house. So the problem that you have um, is well, same thing like within like within this classroom, right? Like I, we have a, we have a certain relationship in this classroom. I don't rule this classroom with an iron fist by any uh, fist, but with any by any stretch of the imagination, right? If someone is in here talking on the phone, yapping on the computer, doing whatever, like get out of the classroom because like I am trying to teach and people are trying to learn here. Right? But there's, this, there's a certain respect that is built among us to where I don't, have to be, I don't have to present myself as just a ruling authority body. If I were to do that, if I were try, going to try or attempt to rule with an iron fist in this classroom, which is a stupid thing to do anyways, because you're adults, uh, and that's not really how I roll with this stuff, uh, it would set up a very combative relationship, though, between us, right? I feel that we have a relationship in this class with, uh, with certain kind of understood uh, mutual respect. But if I were to abuse that, then I would also see more force, right? I would see more resistance from you guys. Um, but even then, within the concept of this classroom, that would, be, that would definitely be a battle that would be fought over and over and over again. But I couldn't do it in the next classroom, right, for another teacher's students. That's one of the problems with having an empire, right? I mean, all empires kind of erode from within, right? Like you see at the Roman, with, with the Roman Empire, they were, had military bases. That just, just the fact that they had to be able to supply food to all of their soldiers that existed across Europe and into Africa was reason enough for the Roman Empire to crumble from within. Same thing with the British Empire. Same thing with the American Empire, right? Like in America, like we've, we, in many respects, people like proudly declared that America is the police of the world. Well, how does that work? We have enough problems with policing in, in the United States in, in and of itself. One of the main problems that we have with policing in the United States um, Take, and that has nothing to do with like the, the I'm not talking about any of the racial stuff or any of the uh, societal stuff. Just in general, is that you don't have police officers from their own neighborhood policing their neighborhood. One of the most effective forms of policing uh, proven is that if you got a guy that grew up in Port Arthur who wants to be a police officer, put him in Port Arthur because he knows the people, he knows the culture, he knows the streets, he knows everything about that place. Same thing with Beaumont, same thing with Bridge City. Don't take a guy from Lumberton and then put him in downtown Orange. Or a guy from downtown Orange and put him in Silsby. Different people, different groups. He doesn't know the people, but he is the ruling body, right? And so there are so many nuances of, beha of, 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 of behavior that are they are so very specific and so very local. To put an authority figure somewhere where they don't know the people or they don't know anything really is just a recipe for disaster, right? You see that all the time with police, like you know, uh, when like police officers and shooting that just get not even taking like the 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 worst stuff, the unjustified shootings, it's just police officers just get scared because they don't know the people. They, don't, they can't read the situation because they're not from there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very logical approach. It seems very clear-headed to us when you sit down and think about it, but that's not how we do things. Uh, so, and that's definitely not how nations do things. That's definitely not how empires do things, right? Because they don't care. It's just this bulldozer, and they just bulldoze their way into other people's lives, into other cultures, other societies, other moralities, other points of view. And then say, I am the authority figure. Do what I say or else. And, like, people, just g people in general, like, someone tells you, do what I say or else. What does that make you want to do? Oh, else. Yes. Yeah. Let's do our else and see how much sand you really got, right? And so that's what he has found himself in. He knows that he shouldn't shoot the elephant. He shoots it anyway. Here. He shoots the elephant three times. Now, it's important that he shoot it three times because the reality of the situation is that he might have shot the elephant 27 times. We don't know. All right? This is based on a true story, but most likely the elephant did not die on the third shot. This is symbolic. Authors use, um, use numbers, they use symbols, they use images to illustrate a point. The number three is important to us 
because we live in a Western society, and in the Western society, uh, Christianity is the dominant, just by far, not even close, the dominant religion. And three is important. Three is the root of Christianity because you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triumphant God in one. The number seven is important to us because the number seven is important in Christianity. Nines, twelves, symbols, right? Symbolism, the, the crucifix, the cross. I can't drive from here to my home without seeing 30 different crosses on the side of the street. Just can't, that can't happen. I know that that symbol is important. I know that any time that someone is out like this, like in a movie, if someone is standing like this for too long, they're going to die, and they're going to be a good guy because they're going to be sacrificed for, for, for the betterment of society and for the betterment of the people in the story. And, uh, and the movie Tropic Thunder with ben, ben Stiller, I don't know if you guys saw that one or not, there's a scene at the beginning where Ben, Stiller, ben Stiller's out like that. And, he's, and they may, it's like a funny, it's a take on Platoon, because Ben Stiller just gets shot like 50 times, but it's out like this. They're recreating a scene from Platoon in which William Defoe is in Vietnam and he gets murdered by his own troop, his own uh, group of soldiers that he is with, just like Jesus was betrayed by his own and killed by his own people, which was the Jews. And William Defoe is like the Christ-like figure, the savior figure in Platoon. And then he gets turned on by his, his very own, and then he gets shot out in the jungle like just like this, um, very famous scene in movie history. Whenever you see people, um, rap, rappers and, um, and, and lead singers do this stuff all the time too. Whenever you go to a concert, you see a lead singer or a rapper, they'll go out to the, at to, to the front of the stage and they'll just put their arms out like this. And the people are like, ah, oh, they'll put their, like, their hands up, they'll have the lighters out. And then they'll be like, you know, they'll be sweating, they'll be pouring out their soul uh, into their music. And then the crowd is going to be feeding off of that music and, and, and getting spiritual nourishment from the music that they create and that they experience together as a group. That can happen on a Saturday night. And then on a Sunday morning, you can wake up and you can go to church and you see the exact same thing. A preacher is doing a call and response thing. Like, can I get an amen? Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Or you have a praise and worship band up there that is singing their hearts out to praise their God. And they're putting their soul into the music that is then nourishing the souls of the people in the audience. What are the people in the audience doing? They get their hands out just like that, trying to connect with that spiritual thing that is out there. But it all goes through you know, like the, the idea of like the, the, the crucifix and, and Christ on the cross, right? Those symbols are important to us. And this, so this has nothing to do with Christianity. This has nothing to do with Christianity. But what it has to do with is playing into certain symbols and numbers and images that we do recognize as important. Whether or not you believe in God, have read the Bible, or a hardcore Christian, doesn't matter. Culturally, it's ingrained because every all art is going to draw or is going to be influenced by the dominating religion of its time. And that is Christianity for Western culture and in our time today. So here, it could be four shots, eight shots, whatever. But it wasn't. There's three shots. Because the author is telling like when you see like the third shot and somebody dies. Like if he gets shot four times, he's like 50 cent. He'll be all right. Not gonna, he's not going to die. Three times, he will die though. Because the author's like, ding, like this is important. Like three, ding. Wait, wake up, stupid. Like pay attention. This is important. So that's what you have. Uh, here. And it's important to note this because remember this is based on a true story. When we talk about like, narrator bias and how this is first person point of view, so there is going to be some bias and there's going to be manipulation, right? So the, the heart of this story is still true. The, the, the purpose of the story is to talk about the conflict that he had and then the, the, the evils of imperialism and how he, how he deals with his lack of identity or his national identi identity overcompensating for his lack of a personal identity. All that's true. But the, some of the events in the story, like the, like the elephant being shot three times, that is a manipulation of factual events. So this is, it's not factually true that he shot the thing three times. Most likely. I don't really know. We don't really know that. But most likely, it is not factually true that he shot the elephant three times. Probably shot like 15 times or something, right? We don't know. But it changes the facts. And that's fine because this is fiction and this is a story and there, he, that's not the truth that he is trying to convey. He's not trying to convey factual black and white truth. He's trying to convey a moral truth, which is different, right? What I want you to remember about this, though, is that if you read an article about another, like a politician or a, a, a future presidential candidate or something on uh, right now that's going on with uh, the Las Vegas shootings and as they profile the, 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 the mass murderer, Right? Watch for watch for manipulations of of these type of things. So where they can use, but where uh, media uh, uh, journalists, filmmakers, they can manipulate factual things in order to portray 
a story in a, on a much more deeper level than, than uh, you may be aware of. So you, and, and what happens is there's like some, this subconscious manipulation, right? So if you're going to read a story about a politician, like, like you say, let's say it's just this old grumpy politician uh, or just an old politician, right? But then they can talk about his eyebrows being real bushy and then kind of like forming like horns and then allude to him doing mean things, right? And so with using this imagery of setting him up like having a bushy, bushy eyebrows that look like horns, he would be more demonic and a grumpier person as opposed to someone that had soft, angelic hair and kind eyes. Does someone having soft, angelic air, uh, hair, like white hair and kind eyes, are they going to be much more likely to do nice things or bad things? Nice. Yeah, but there is no evidence to support the fact, right? It's just how they are described. That is a manipulation of facts, of black and white data, that becomes subjective, that subconsciously informs the way that you feel about that person. Whenever it's in stories, that's fine, right? But if, if you rely on those to get black and white facts, not moral truths, you can find yourself um, being confronted with like some harsh realities. Okay?